at um, BAK, Egyptian Initiate. There, there are two volumes on the training of this initiate. And if you really want to go through what it was like, you can actually put yourself in the position of a person going through this initiation and educational process so that you come out uh, in the inner temple. Uh, all I can say is that it's well worth the, any amount of time that you can invest if you want to really understand uh, how we were educating our people when we were doing it on our own. Yeah. You can ask at least 15 questions because I passed you by <laughs> four times. I too uh, am happy to see you here. I have for years wanted to meet you, um, although it would probably shock and feel um, you know me better than you do. I know your brother. Uh, I'm the founder of the School of Ethnic Studies here. All right. My name is Mary Al Anna Al <laughs> but she will appreciate it. Uh, I wanted to ask you a number of questions. One of them related to the fact that you, you stated that the names as well as the history of Egypt, of Kemet, had been changed. Right. And I wondered if you will elucidate on what would be the proper name for, what is, for who is called Jesus Christ. The, the proper name for Jesus Christ? Well, uh, yeah, I can say a little something about that because as far as I know, Jesus Christ is not Egyptian. But there are, there's a book out called Did Jesus Live 100 Years B.C.? which suggests that the, the name in history that you can, you can, in other words, if you're looking for, if, if you don't need a historical record, then you just stick with whatever, you know, you believe to be the interpretation of the Bible, and you don't believe. If you require a historical record, then uh, what one of the things you find is that uh, the person doesn't appear when they're supposed to appear in history. Christ doesn't appear at the time of zero, but appears 100 years before. And the name that is given in that reference uh, is uh, G Joshua Pandera, uh, ben Bendera. And in other words, that's a person who matches uh, the history that is attributed to uh, uh, Christ at later time. And then there's some other stuff that Massey gets into, into the origin of, uh, of Christ. Uh, in his book, um, uh, the Historical Jesus and the Physical Christ, one of the chapters. His book, uh, he's got, I think it's, it's not Natural Genesis. What's the book for that chapter? But Gerald Matthew has a, uh, a set of volumes out that gets into, delves into the history of both the symbols and the name. And that's the best I can come up with, but it's not a part of the uh, Egyptian history per se. Although some people suggested that Christ studied it. Okay, the second question would be what would be the proper name for what is called the continent of Africa? Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, it really is because, uh, first place, I don't know if we'll be able to answer that, but we do know that that there were a number of names prior to the name Africa. Uh, I've heard people say that Africa was the Greek name for the continent. I thought Massey, Gerald Massey, who studied it, said, no, it comes out of an Africa name, Africa Rui He goes into the whole derivative uh, of the word. But we do know that long before it had that name, the earlier names were names like Cush, uh, which referred not just to the country of Cush, but in the minds of people, they were, they were talking about the whole of what was then known as the continent of Cush. Uh, around Egypt, they called themselves Kemen, uh, uh, Tameri, Tanisi, and then Tameri says Al-Kibulan, and he picks that as one of the oldest names. That, for the longest time, I prefer to go with the name of Dr. Ben, al -Kubulan. So if I'm talking about the whole continent, I like al -Kubulan. But I don't know that that's the earliest or oldest name, or even that there was one name by which the whole continent was known. Uh, people usually knew the part of the continent that they, they had that part they were familiar with, and they, they didn't know the rest of it, but they would attribute the name to everything else. And so that meant that they were naming a very limited part of the continent rather than the whole of it. So the best I can give you is I'll be blind. That's, for, that's my preference. Uh, but in addition to that, if you're talking about specific areas like Egypt, Kemet is my preference. And if you're talking, and Ethiopia is not my preference. In other words, Ethiopia is a Greek word which means burnt faced people. In other words, this is what, 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 what was noticeable to Greek people about the Ethiopian people with their dark skin. So they said, those are the dark skinned people. That's what Ethiopia means. Those are the black people. Uh, it, it is not the name that Ethiopians had given them. 
themselves. And the last question is, in all of your research on Kemet and the various dynasties, did you see any incident of slavery? And if so, how so? It, 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 incident of slavery? No. Uh, thank, you for, thank you very much for asking that last question. Uh, so many people say, well, look at the pyramid. Uh, they must have really had a lot of slave labor to build a pyramid. There is not one whit of evidence anywhere that there was slave labor that built the pyramid. <clears throat> or even where slavery existed, if it existed, that it had the same form as we think of it. For example, the word slave couldn't have existed <clears throat> because it doesn't come up because that's a European word. It means Slav. It comes from the word Slav or Slavic country. And it referred to the unique condition <clears throat> that, that occurred in Europe at a particular time. And the form of slavery when it got to this country was even different than the way it was in Europe. Now to go back in history and say you understood without reference to a single document. In other words, I want to know if somebody says that, I want to see that in the hieroglyphic somewhere that they had slaves. What we find is that there were periods of time during which, maybe because of flooding or other reasons, there would be large numbers of people who would be unoccupied and that because of the religious orientation of the country, it was easy to get people to commit themselves to uh, building certain kinds of religious symbols and so forth that benefited the whole country. Especially, for example, a pyramid that doesn't belong to anybody. You build uh, a governor's mansion, the governor lives in the mansion. Nobody lived in the pyramid. No one was buried, buried in the pyramid. You know, people say the pyramid were, weren't those vain pharaohs to have their body have, have people, all these slaves, build this building just so that they could have a place to keep their body. There's no body in the pyramid. <laughs> the bodies are in the tombs near the pyramid. Uh, there is a king's chamber, which is called that by the people who found it. We don't know what the Egyptians called it. They didn't call it the king and the queen's chamber. The, all they could think was that somebody was trying to rule somebody else, and the king and the queen must have done this, that, or the other. But what you know is there were rooms that served certain functions. And it appears that the room that we call the king's chamber in the pyramid was a room where certain kinds of initiation ceremonies were carried out and certain kinds of scientific operations were carried out. Like there were certain observations of stars, uh, the way you treated weights and measures. For example, that room is always the same temperature when, whenever you go in. And even now, you don't need air conditioning. After all those thousands of people have been in, in, uh, in, uh, in the pyramid. So, uh, the whole notion that there was a, uh, a slave period would have to be proven by reference to something other than the inference that it took a lot of people to do it, that you could not get these people to do it willingly, therefore you had to enslave them in order to make them do it, and therefore it took slaves to make the pyramid. It's strictly a rational, I, I should call it an irrational, rational argument, uh, because there's not a basis anywhere, in fact, that I have come across anywhere, no document, nowhere in any part of Egyptian history refers to the use of slave labor. To, as a matter of fact, it had to be skilled labor. You know, to cut the stone, stone cutting was a skilled labor job. And uh, the pictures that they have on how these things were accomplished to the extent that they share that with them uh, doesn't look like, as a matter of fact, it didn't take as many people for some things as you thought. Uh, they had uh, one, one picture on uh, how some of the large uh, monoliths were moved, you know, like the uh, Ramesses statue were moved on sleds. And it turns out that it doesn't take, you can almost move the, the, this huge uh, multi-ton uh, megalith with just a very few men. You know, a couple dozen men can move that thing. If you put it on a wooden sled and if you wet down the sand in front of the sled. As a matter of fact, when they finally got ready to uh, the transport the atomic reactor at Los Alamos across the sand. What they did was to copy this method of transportation. They put it on a wooden sled and went down in front of it. And, and then they were able, it's almost like you could get behind it and push it like uh, it's a little a play card. In other words, it, it doesn't take as much labor if you have technical knowledge of how to do things as you might think it takes. And so people are speaking in ignorance when they talk about uh, all the slavery that went on in ancient Egypt. Now, I'm not saying that there was not any slavery, but I'm saying I don't have any evidence that there was. And so since I don't have any evidence that there was, I'm not going to project that 
onto the, I'm not project that sickness onto the Egyptian thing. But we have. <laughs> um, it's two o'clock. We'll allow one more question from someone that hasn't asked one before, and then we have to wind it up. All the way in the back. You talked about earlier the, uh, the first, the oldest recorded city, civilization, I think that's what you said, it was around in Nubia. Could you elaborate on that and talk about the connection between Egypt and Nubia? Yeah. I, I mentioned that Taseti, T A S E T I. Ta is land and Seti is the bow. But the land of the bow is the oldest city, the, the oldest nation, not city. It's the oldest nation. Now remember, uh, there was a dam built on the Nile River. And behind that dam, as the water filled up the river valley, it, in effect, it wiped Nubia out. I don't know how many people really understand that. But Nubia really was finished when they built the Aswan Dam because the Nile River is only, the land is only useful about a mile or two on either side of the river for the full length of the, the time that it's in Egypt and Nubia. And so if you build a dam, you cover the land that people live on. And so that lake that's behind the dam, Lake Nassau, is 450 miles long, far from here to Los Angeles. That's how far the lake is now. But if you build a lake like that, you wipe out everybody who used to be there. They have urban renewed all those people up the hill. And uh, they got them living in little, you know, uh, shelters now. They can't make a living like they used to because there's nothing growing. You know, there's no dirt for things to grow in. And uh, there's really nothing but scorpions and snakes out there now. And there's not, not enough fish to keep them living and everything. But more than that, it covered the book of black history. That lake covered the book of black history. The last site that they excavated in a rush job before the waters filled up that lake was Tassetti. Uh, and it turned out that it was the richest site archaeologically, and they dug up all of these kings, all these black kings, tall men of Negroid appearances, the way they describe it. These black kings were dug up in Tassetti, and then it turns out they can hook Tassetti, Dr. Bruce Williams at the Oriental Institute in Chicago, uh, is the one who has evaluated the Tassetti site, written about it in the Journal of African Civilization, also presented at the Nile Valley Conference, and when I talked to him, told me that uh, things get pretty hot. You know, that he had to get permission before he could publish from the Oriental Institute and say what he said. And then later this came out in the New York Times uh, that 200 years before Egypt got started, here was another nation that had Pharaoh, that had the worship of Isis and Horus and Osiris, <laughs> you know, that had the same, in other words, the same religious, political, and economic system that Egypt had existed before 200 years, and it's found way south of Egypt in Nubia. And you remember it was Nubians, that first, that first president I showed you of Egypt was a Nubian. His name was Narma, Aha, and he invaded what is now Egypt from the south, from Nubia, to set up the first kingdom in Egypt. And he brought with him forms of government, forms of economy, and so forth that were peculiarly Nubian. So the first Egyptian civilization was Nubian coming from uh, Tasseti. Let me uh, just uh, close this off by, if you give me just a chance, to uh, read a couple quick quotes from uh, the Husea, which is the sacred text, which is one of the oldest Bibles in the world, which is the committed Bible. I just want you to see. see I say these things, but if you don't get a feeling for what they were talking about, it's hard to concretize it and get some kind of appreciation for what was going on. Uh, from Ptah Hotep, Ptah meaning one of the manifestations of God, Hotep meaning satisfied. Ptah Hotep, God is satisfied. Ptah Hotep, if God grants you children, may the heart of their father and mother know them. Whoever hungers, let them be satisfied in the house of the mother. Father, and let them find there a wall which protects them. Be not without a generous heart, for it is God that gives you wealth. The Tahotel continues, double the gifts your mother gave you and care for her as she cared for you. She bore a heavy burden in you and did not abandon you. When she brought you forth after, her, after your months, she was still closely bound to you, for her breath was still in your mouth for up to three years. 
while you grew, grew, she'd clean out your field and didn't say, oh, what shall I do? She placed you in school to be educated and came there daily on your behalf with bread and beer for your teacher. Thus, when you became a young man, when you become a young man and marry a wife, eat not bread while another stands by without extending your hand to him or her. As for food, it is always here. It is men and women who do not remain. The person may be rich or poor, but bread remains with those who share it. One who was rich last year may be a vagrant this year. Therefore, be not anxious to fill your belly without regard for others, for you know not where your course will lead. If you become needy, another may be doing good by you. The water course of last year has disappeared, and this year another stream takes its place. Great waters have become tracts of dry land, and seashores have disappeared into the ocean's depth. No man or woman then walks in a single way. This is a lesson from the Lord of life. And then finally, from Ashishan. May the elder brother of the town be the one to whom it is entrusted. So just in case the elder brother doesn't do right. <laughs> may the kindest brother of the family be the one who acts as the elder brother. I have something, my relatives, I have something, and my relatives have something. May I have something, and my relatives have something so that I may eat my own without holding back. May the flood waters never fail to come. May the field never fail to flourish. May children do honor to their father and mother. May the moon follow the sun and not fail to rise. May I recognize my friends that I may share my goods with them. May I recognize my brother and sister that I may open my heart to them. And may life always follow death. May life always follow death. Ooh, thank you.